Thank you very much. Um, thank you also very much for giving me the opportunity to talk here. I have been asked to give a presentation of my recent work on quantum electrodynamics in 2 plus 1 space-time dimensions, and in particular the possibility of spontaneous breaking of Lorentz symmetry in this theory. And this is basically a follow-up work on, on an old project done with Holger and, and Jens and, and Dietrich a couple of years ago. So why at all should one be interested in studying quantum electrodynamics in three space-time dimensions? Well, initially this theory was just conceived as a toy model for, in fact, the theory of quarks, quantum chromodynamics, in four space-time dimensions. And this is because it's a much simpler theory than QCD on a technical level, but in terms of physics, it's very similar. In particular, it's, it's also asymptotically free once we go to shorter distances to the, uh, to the ultra, uh, ultraviolet, then the gauge coupling, the effective fine structure constant, goes to small values. But in the infrared, at larger distances, then the, the gapless fermions interact strongly, and in fact, they, they, they might develop a spontaneous, spontaneously uh, uh, a dynamically generated gap due to chiral symmetry breaking. In its compact version also, QD3 might uh, show a confinement transition. However, it was then later realized that, in fact, QD3 is much more than just a playground for theorists, than more than just a toy model. It describes real physics, real materials. And, and, and in particular, it has been derived as an effective low energy theory for the supernatic states and the high temperature cuprates, but also in very different other aspects of quantum condensed matter physics, this theory kind of pops up. For example, in, in spin systems with just localized spins, the elementary excitations being just yeah, as spin degrees, bosonic spin degrees of freedom, when there is strong frustration, say on a triangular or a Kagomi type of lattice, then this theory uh, might uh, develop a spin, a spin liquid ground state with fractionalized excitations which turn out to be of fermionic nature. In, in particular, in, in, in certain cases, then these fractionalized excitations can be Dirac fermions coupled to U1 gauge field, QD3. Very recently, QD3 theory also popped up in, 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 in the fractional quantum Hall effect as in field theory for the Huffield Landau level state. And a simultaneous development was to generalize the, the bosonic particle vortex identity to fermionic systems with at its heart lying the conjecture that the dual description of, of a single Dirac fermion, as it occurs, for example, on, a, on, a, on the surface of a topological insulator, is in fact, again, QD3. For all these applications, the number of fermions that couples to the U1 gauge field differs. For example, it's, it's n equals 2 in, numbers of, uh, in terms of four component fermions in, in, in this high temperature cuprate uh, uh, application. In order to make use of this of these effective theory, we therefore need to know the ground state as a function of n, the number of fermions. In fact, this ground state, t equals zero phase diagram, was under debate the last couple of 30 years or so. And the kind of common, more or less, scenario is, is that we have two phases. There is, a, at large n, large number of fermions, there is a conformal phase with a conformal fixed point interacting gapless fermions uh, yeah, uh, which in condensed matter physics could be understood as a non-fermion liquid. However, below a certain critical number of fermions, the number of which is under debate, fermions are expected to develop a dynamical gap, chiral symmetry breaking, and in, in condensed matter physics, this could be understood as a mod insulator. In this talk, I'm going to argue in a certain controlled limit of this theory that it's impossible to have a direct transition from this conformal state to the chiral broken phase. In particular, I would therefore distinguish between two different critical flavor numbers, and I call them the conformal critical flavor number, below which conformal symmetry, the, the conformal state becomes unstable, and the chiral critical flavor number, below which the chiral symmetry breaking occurs. I will in particular show that this chiral critical flavor number is smaller than the conformal critical flavor number, at least in a certain limit of this, of this theory. There is therefore an intermediate phase, and I will argue that most, most likely this intermediate phase is characterized by spontaneous Lorentz symmetry breaking. Here's the outline of the talk. I will start with epsilon expansion around the lower critical dimension of two space-time dimensions, 
to show that there is a finite conformal critical favorite number for any finite epsilon below which this conformal state becomes unstable, but this conformal critical flavor number becomes arbitrarily large as long as we're going close to this lower critical dimension. In the second step, I will then argue using some RG monotonicity arguments that we can find an upper bound for the possibility of chiral symmetry breaking, which in fact, in, the, in this limit close to the lower critical dimension, being just one in terms of four-component Dirac fermions. There's therefore a large range of values of n below which chiral symmetry breaking is forbidden, but the conformal state is unstable. And finally, uh, I use mean field theory. Again, this, this, uh, these RG monotonicity arguments, the F theorem, as well as an independent susceptibility analysis to argue that this intermediate phase be, be, between chiral uh, N chi SB and N conf is governed by a vector order parameter V mu, which gets a vacuum expectation value. Here's the model, plain QED, but now below four space-time dimensions, a field strength tensor F, coupled to Dirac fermions Psi and Psi bar via this covariant derivative capital D, and this, this covariant uh, derivative involves the gauge charge, if you like, E, and E has mass dimension E squared four minus D. So that means below four space-time dimensions, it's a relevant parameter towards the infrared, and therefore, uh, goes to larger values of the coupling. To the ultraviolet, however, we, it goes to smaller gauge coupling, and therefore QED3 is, is, is asymptotically free and super renormalizable. This theory enjoys the chiral SU2 and symmetry, where chirality is, in, in, in that respect, in these three space-time dimensions, just a consequence of the reducible four-dimensional representation of the Clifford algebra. We use four component Dirac fermions has explicitly uh, the parity symmetry, parity anomaly is absent, and no turn simons term is generated. Of course, Lorentz symmetry and local U1 gauge symmetry is also uh, enjoyed by this theory. Once we do RG, however, new interactions which are not present in the initial action can be generated by the loop corrections. Most of them, at least close, close to the lower critical dimension, will be irrelevant just by power counting. However, local four fermion terms are marginal in two space-time dimensions. At any interacting fixed points in, in, in two plus epsilon dimensions, therefore we have to take them into account because they can become irrelevant at such an interacting fixed point. Fortunately, the number of, of, uh, of, of such four fermion terms is strongly restricted by the large symmetry of our QD3 action. In fact, what we can show is that any four fermion term can be written as a linear combination of these two old acquaintances. This is G1, which, which, which is the coupling in front of gros neveu type of interaction with, with uh, gamma 3, 5 being the product of gamma 3 and gamma 5, the, the two leftover uh, gamma matrices which are not present in our kinetic term. And G2, uh, which, which, which is a, a tearing type of interaction known from the tearing model in two plus one dimensions. The charge has a particularly simple form for its flow, and this is due to the word identity, due to, due to the gauge, uh, gauge symmetry. In fact, to any loop order, the, the flow equation for the charge should always be uh, written in, in this form, d minus four plus eta a times e squared. Eta a to arbitrary order, at least, is, is unknown, but we can compute it to leading order. However, independent of the order we calculate, we therefore see that as long as we're in the perturbative regime, eta a is small, we always flow to larger values of e squared, and finally, the flow only stops if eta a is 4 minus d. So that means that independent of the loop order, exactly, eta a must be 4 minus d at any charged fixed point. In fact, if, if we now uh, use this, this information for the scaling of the photon propagator at such a charged fixed point, then the exponent in, in, in Fourier space of the photon propagator must be 2 minus d, and that means it becomes constant, the photon propagator, in, in two dimensions, two space-time dimensions. And this is nothing but the well-known result of the Schwinger model, a massive photon in two dimensions. In three dimensions, we recover also an, a known result that the, the photon propagator goes as 1 over absolute value of q. And this is basically, this is fact exactly the result known from first and as well as second order one over n expansion for, for this photon propagator. 
and, and from this argument, we now conjecture that's actually true uh, to any order in the one over n expansion. However, once we now have such a strong charge, E squared, then new, uh, new couplings G1 and G2 will be generated by this box diagram. So how does the flow look like once we have now this strong charge? Here is the flow uh, for, for large, in, in, a large n limit, infinite n limit, um, now projected onto the charge E squared and G2 Turing type of short range coupling plane. We have, besides the Gaussian fixed point at, ze at zero coupling, three interacting fixed points. A Turing fixed point at, at a non-vanishing short range coupling, which can be understood as ultraviolet completion of the Turing model, and two charged fixed points. If now the red line uh, is, is the RG trajectory of pure Q, the pure QED action, if we start the, the flow for, say, uh, small gauge coupling and uh, initially vanishing short range interaction, we end up at this fully attractive fixed point. And since we're at large n, that's precisely the conformal fixed point, the, the, the fixed point which relates to the conformal state of the large n QED. However, there's also a quantum critical point with one relevant direction. And once we lower now this, this, uh, this fermion number n, then these two fixed points approach each other. In particular, if we lower it towards some conformal critical flavor number, then they merge onto a single point, and below this conformal critical flavor number, they disappear into the complex plane, the fixed point annihilation. Now, if we start the RG flow close to this Gaussian fixed point for the pure QED action, the red line, then what happens is that we have a runaway flow always towards divergent G2. So the conformal state below this conformal critical flavor number is gone. The question is, of course, what is this instability to? We can compute this conformal critical flavor number within this 2 plus epsilon expansion, and what we find is that, in fact, it becomes arbitrarily large once epsilon is small enough. Now, we're now going to argue that this instability, it's impossible to have chiral symmetry breaking because the reason is that this instability happens at large n, and at such large value of n, it should be impossible to have, well, as we'll see, so many numbers of Goldstone modes. Now, we'll use RG monotonicity arguments to show that. These, these uh, arguments are based on the simple observation that the effective number of degrees of freedom that play a role in, in a certain system always decreases under the RG. And, and a simple example would be the Wilson-Fisher ON fixed point where we have N critical modes, but on either side of the transition, we have less than N critical modes, massless modes. There are only N minus one massless Goldstone modes in the broken phase, and there are even zero massless modes in the symmetric phase. Of course, to make use of any of that, that uh, we need to somehow quantify this effective measure uh, of, of, of effective number of degrees of freedom. But fortunately, this has been done in one plus one dimension uh, by some logic of showing that actually the central charge of the conformal algebra C gives such a measure of the effective number of degrees of freedom. This C, uh, in fact, uh, he was able to show that C always decreases under the RG and becomes stable at any fixed point. In particular, this means that at any ultraviolet fixed point, the C must be larger than the C at the infrared fixed point. And in, in a certain sense, we can imagine the theory space as, as a landscape with, with, with hills and, and valleys, and always ultraviolet lives kind of for large values of C on, on top of the mountains, and infrared fixed point live in the valleys. And the flow always needs to be from, from large values of C to small values of C. The flow, RG flow, in a certain sense, always goes downhill with respect to C, the central charge. This theorem has uh, recently been generalized to higher dimension um, following a proposal by Cardi in 3 plus 1 dimension, the anomaly coefficient, so-called Cardi's A theorem, but only recently has been uh, rigorously proven in four dimensions. But then uh, it, it now uh, ha is also known in three dimensions where a similar quantity, which in, yeah, gives this effective number of degrees of freedom, is F 
the so-called sphere-free energy, which is obtained when the theory, theory the conformal field theory, is lo, uh, conformally mapped to a three-sphere embedded in four, four space-time dimensions. So, uh, very recently, between these three seemingly independent quantities, connection has, has been possible to make by introducing this quantity F tilde, the so-called generalized sphere-free energy F. This generalized F, F tilde, in fact, could, we're able, when we're able to show that this generalized F becomes precisely a constant times the central charge in two dimensions, it is exactly the sphere-free energy F itself in three dimensions, and it is proportional, again, to the A anomaly coefficients in four dimensions. We therefore have for any integer dimension that this F tilde fulfills RG monotonicity, and it's a, that's, a, that's a rigorous statement. F tilde in any integer dimension at an ultraviolet fixed point must be larger than its value at an infrared fixed point. F tilde is, is, a, is a quantity which is continuous in the space-time dimension D, and therefore, just from anal analyticity, we, we, we would expect that this holds, this RG monotonicity also holds in continuous dimension, not only in integer dimension. There is no rigorous proof for this statement yet, but there's various evidence in, in various different types of systems, often to high order in epsilon expansion, that this F tilde fulfills RG monotonicity in any dimension, also in fractional dimension. In fact, this F tilde has, has an, plays an important role in, in quantum information theory. There, uh, one wants to know the, the so-called entanglement entropy, which is a measure of how the states are entangled uh, in, in a particular system. This entanglement entropy is, is defined by, by dividing a system into a subsystem A and, and its complement A bar, and computing the, 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 the von Neumann entropy of the reduced, so-called reduced density matrix, which is obtained by tracing just over the states of, of, of the outer system A bar. In fact, one can compute this entanglement entropy for, for different simple types of system. For example, in this very simplest example where both A and A bar are just two level states, then if the whole system is in a product state, say both spins pointing upwards, that's a non-entangled state, then it turns out that this entanglement entropy is in fact is in exactly zero. However, if, if we're in a non-product state, in this EPR state, for example, then entanglement entropy is non-zero. In fact, one can show that entanglement entropy scales linearly with the number of entangled states between A and A bar. An important question is, how does entanglement entropy scale with the size of this subsystem with A, with, say with a radius R? For trivially gapped state, there's, there's a, a, yeah, a well-known law in, in this field, the so-called area law, that the entanglement entropy always should scale in three dimensions, in three spatial dimensions, as R squared, and in two plus one dimensions, in our case, it should scale linearly, it should scale proportionally to R. However, for, for non-trivial conformal, for example, phases, this area law is violated, in particular, in two plus one dimensions, there one can show that there is a constant shift with, with this constant, usually called gamma. It was recently shown that this gamma is in fact nothing but the sphere-free energy. And similar relations also hold in one plus one and three plus one dimensions. We therefore have that these universal coefficients in the scaling of this entanglement entropy are again monotonous quantities under renormalization group. They fulfill RG monotonicity arguments, and these quantities should be larger at any ultraviolet fixed point than their values at the infrared fixed point. I'm now going to assume that this theorem not only holds in integer dimensions, but also in two, in two plus epsilon dimensions, non-integer dimensions. If we assume so, then we, we can make uh, strong statements about possible RG phases. Uh, sorry, infrared phases. We can compute, for example, the, the F tilde at the ultraviolet fixed point, and not too surprisingly, it's proportional to n the number of gapless fermionic states in, in this theorem theory. Uh, for the other uh, possible candidate infrared phases, for example, the conformal state, we in fact find, uh, find that it also goes linearly with n, the number of, of, uh, of gapless fermions, but there's a constant shift, and this constant shift is negative, such that, in fact, 
uh, f uv is always larger than f conf. And this is reassuring because then our proposed flow from this ultraviolet Gaussian fixed point to the conformal QD3 QD fixed point is in fact uh, perfectly consistent with this generalized F theorem. However, we already know that this, this uh, conformal fixed point annihilates and the conformal state becomes unstable. And the question is, is it possible then to have chirosymmetry breaking? Chirosymmetry breaking with the breaking pattern U2n going to Un times Un would have two n squared massless Goldstone modes. And therefore, F tilde also goes with n squared, the number of, of, of Goldstone modes. And therefore, for large n, it's impossible that F uv is larger than F chi sv. And according to this F theorem, it's impossible to have a flow from the ultraviolet fixed point to such a chirosymmetry breaking infrared phase if n is large. In fact, we find that it's always larger, F chi sb is always larger than F uv if n is larger than 1 in terms of four component Dirac fermions. One four component Dirac fermion is therefore, assuming this generalized F theorem, a strict upper bound for the possibility of chiral symmetry breaking close to the lower critical dimension. However, we knew, know already that the conformal critical flavor number is very large close to the lower critical dimension. And therefore, it's impossible near and below this, lower, uh, this conformal critical flavor number that, that this, this phase this instability is towards chiral symmetry breaking. The phase below this conformal crit critical flavor number cannot exhibit chiral symmetry breaking. And that must be a novel intermediate phase. At least it's not, yeah, it's not chiral breaking. So what can it be? There's a beautiful theorem by Waffe and Witten showing that QD3 should have first an unbroken UN times UN symmetry at least. Therefore, U to N going to U N times U N is the only possible chiral breaking pattern. No other breaking patterns with, say, less than, than N, 2 N squared massless Goldstone modes is forbidden by this waffer witten theorem. Secondly, the waffer witten theorem also tells us that the spectrum in the effect of, of QD3 should, ha should be gapless, should be, have a gapless spectrum. And this rules out plain parity symmetry breaking by which the, the fermions would acquire a, a, a mass, a gap, but there wouldn't be any Goldstone modes and the spectrum would not, no longer be gapless. So what else can it be? Well, insight into the problem can be gained by again looking at the flow. When we look at the flow, we see within this epsilon expansion that it's always towards diverging G2. But both E squared, the charge, and G1, this gross nerve type of interaction, remain finite. So effectively, on a mean field level, this, this theory in the infrared looks as if there were gapless fermions, Dirac fermions, coupled via a G2 type of tearing type of interaction. On mean field level, this theory, however, can be solved. What we find is it's a free energy for a vector order parameter V mu, which relates to the, to the uh, U1 current. So this, what is, this is going, uh, trying to tell us is that for large G2, this vac vector order parameter, composite vector order parameter, acquires a vacuum expectation value. However, if a vector order parameter acquires a vacuum expectation value, this means it selects a direction in two plus one dimensional space time, and, and therefore it spontaneously breaks the Lorentz invariance. If, for example, V mu has a temporal component for mu equals zero, then in, an, in a condensed matter system, this, this uh, such a state could experimentally re reveal itself by a spontaneous formation of some type of charge order. It's therefore perfectly consistent both with waffer witten theorem as well as with the F theorem. In fact, this, this conclusion can independently on also obtained by, by an, a susceptibility analysis, now again controlled in two plus epsilon dimensions. We add to the action, small, infinitesimally small, symmetry breaking terms, seeds, magnetic fields, if you like, of chiral, uh, uh, yeah, which break chiral symmetry, parity symmetry, some type of Kekulé order, or Lorentz symmetry. And then we compute the flow by these diagrams to leading order in, in, in these small uh, masses and get these exponents x, which are related by the usual scaling form of the free energy to the susceptibility 
t exponents gamma for these different types of orders. In fact, what we find at this quantum critical point that there is a unique order which, which uh, turns out to have a positive susceptibility exponent gamma. And this gamma is, is, is exactly one. It, it's the gamma which is related to the Lorentz symmetry breaking delta mu uh, mass or uh, order parameter, I should say. This again corroborates our conclusion in two plus epsilon dimensions now that this instability is towards the spontaneous breaking of the Lorentz symmetry. Now, all that I've said so far was controlled only in the limit of small epsilon. The question is, of course, what happens in the physical case of d equals three space-time dimensions. That's a difficult problem because we're at finite n now and, 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 and at d equals three beyond, uh, above the, the lower critical dimension. It's strong coupling and it's difficult to answer. However, by the F theorem, we can at least find a more or less strict upper bound for the possibility of chiral symmetry breaking again. And what, by comparing these F quantities, and what we now find is that in D equals three, a rigorous upper bound would be that chiral symmetry breaking is not allowed to occur above 4.4 in terms of four component fermions. To make a prediction for the conformal critical flavor number is a little bit harder, but using different methods ranging from our old work uh, uh, using a functional RG, as well as just naively extrapolating these two plus epsilon results and, 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 and as well as a one loop expansion and fixed dimension, we get values between four and 10. So as long as this chiral uh, critical, uh, chiral critical flavor number does not exactly saturate this upper bound, and this conformal critical flavor number does not saturate this, say, lower bound of four, then there may be, an even in, D, in D equals C in the physical dimension, an intermediate range of values where chiral symmetry breaking is not yet allowed, but the conformal state is unstable. But of course, to nail it on, in particular, this number, higher order calculations are necessary. So here's the phase diagram in, in, in D, space-time dimension D, and fermion number N plane. Most of what I've said is, uh, is related to this upper left corner. And there we can find a fully controlled approximation, an expansion in, in two plus epsilon dimensions. And there we can compute this conformal critical flavor number and can show explicitly via the susceptibility analysis that the, the instability is towards Lorentz symmetry breaking. In fact, this, this is the only instability which is consistent with both Barfa Witten and the F theorem. In D equals three, this conformal critical flavor number becomes smaller, and the possibility of the upper bound for the chiral critical flavor number becomes larger. And so we don't, do not yet know what quite happens in D equals three, but at least from these, from these uh, approaches, we suggest that there, there, there may, may, may be also this intermediate phase, also the physical dimension. So let me conclude. Three-dimensional QED has a conformal ground state if the number of fermions n is larger than a certain conformal critical flavor number. And in two plus epsilon dimension, this conformal critical flavor number has a particular value, but it becomes very large once we're going to uh, the lower critical dimension. Because this conformal critical flavor number is so large, the common scenario that this instability is below this, this, uh, below this conformal state is towards chiral symmetry breaking is in, inconsistent with the generalized F theorem. And this, this is definitely true at least as long as we're uh, in, within the epsilon expansion. The reason is that we're, there are just too many Goldstone modes for this chiral symmetry breaking to occur. The only possibility that is consistent both with Waffer Witten as well as with the F theorem, is a conformal critical, uh, below this conformal critical flavor number, is that spontaneous lower sym symmetry breaking occurs. And in fact, it's precisely this conclusion that one is led to by an independent mean field as well as a susceptibility analysis, which confirm this existence of the Lorentz symmetry breaking phase. In D equals three, we, we do not yet know much, but at least the extrapolation as well as a perturbative expansion in, in fixed D equals three suggests that there is a finite window of Lorentz symmetry breaking phase also in the physical dimension. 
thank you very much for your attention.